Hey everybody, this is going to be about your periodic table and how to read your periodic table. Um, essentially, your periodic table is just the table that um, showcases all of the natural and man-made or synthetic um, elements in our universe. Um, the elements that you find on Earth could be found um, on another planet. That's how they sort of detect what kind of, um, um, how far a planet is or if a planet is getting farther from Earth or closer or um, just kind of what kind of substance are on each other planet based on um, emission spectra which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later not in this video um, but the basics of your periodic table is arranged in um, pretty unique order it wasn't just kind of established into this way but it does actually make a logical sense so if you look at this periodic table you can see that um, you know how you want to read this is that you can see there are top numbers here at the top. Um, these numbers are actually um, your families. So if you look at this one, this is your first group, um, second group, or you can say family number two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. You notice that every time I click on each of these families or groups, it highlights the entire family. So basically why it's all highlighted is that all of these ones would really have share really similar properties. That's the, the importance of these families. If I click on the second one, um, all of these ones, entire families, share really unique um, similar characteristics. Likewise with 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I'll talk about these numbers after. If you look at these ones, then you have your seven periods so that's period one so these periods are actually going across period two three and then four five six and seven these ones are actinites and lanthanites uh, which we'll talk about well i don't think we'll get into that uh, those ones here but to just read the basics um, of your periodic table the key thing of each of these groups um, they have different properties so the first group that you want to be aware of is your alkali metals and alkali metals um, for group number one um, they're very reactive so that means that if you put these metals in water it will react and um, why they're number one is that if you ever were to draw the Bohr model let me just get my um, pen here if you were to draw the Bohr model here say if you take lithium why lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium all share similar properties is that when you're drawing them, they all on the outside. So here's your lithium nucleus, and then since it has this is what one, two, three. So there's three protons, and then um, if it's neutral, then we have three electrons. So to how you draw the Bohr model is that you're going to have two in the first ring. So that's like your orbital. That's your shell. And then those are your two electrons. That's the maximum it can hold. So to get another one, to get the third one, you need to draw another ring, another orbital. So that's going to be your third one. So the unique property of alkali metals, aside from that they're being very reactive or that they react violently with water, is that um, one really important thing to know is their valence number or the number of the electrons they have in the outside shell. So if you can see from this one, this is your nucleus. So this is where you have your protons and electrons and I mean the electrons and I mean protons and neutrons actually in the nucleus. And on the outside, on these orbitals, these are your electrons. So you can see on the outside most ring, the last one, there's only one electron. So that's a similar characteristic that's going to be found in all alkali metals. So if you go draw for lithium, draw for sodium, draw for potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium on the outside ring outside shell you will not have only one electron that lone electron actually is what makes it so reactive and um, if we look at the second one second group that we'll talk about this is going to be oh, let me change my pen here and the second group that we're going to talk about is your alkali earth metal so this one instead of alkali this is alkaline earth metals um, the unique thing is as we go across your period as we go across here the number of electrons in the outside shell actually increases so that one could just if you remember it as being just one electron alkaline earth is family number two so it has two electrons in outside shell so if we were to draw um, the Bohr model for say beryllium 
you would instead of having one, two, and then three, you would have another electron out here because that's a property of alkaline earth. So um, that is shared amongst all of the family or group number two. So beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, bar barium, radium, all these ones on the outside shell would have just two electrons. And in the middle, these are your transition metals. And then this is all going to jump and hop to the th um, th third group. And the reason why we hop to the third group is that in the middle in the transition metals, their orbitals, their shells are a little bit uh, different in its ordering. So as you take a higher level chem class, you're going to understand the orbitals and you're going to understand why that is. But at this point, we're not going to talk about that. For the third family, um, this is group number three. So you can think that since this one has one electron outside shell, this entire um, group has two. Well, the third one, yeah, it has just three um, groups on the outside shell. So if you were to draw it on the last one, you would have three electrons circling on the outside shell. And again, the outside electrons are called valence electrons. So anytime you hear valence electrons, that's your outside electron. Not all of them, but just the outside. I always got confused by that when I was learning chemistry. But um, as you get more practice, just remember this one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, and eight. All those represent the number of valence electrons, the electrons on the outside shell, because really chemistry is all about the electrons because that's the electrons are what makes bonding happen. So as we go across this group, um, here's number four. All these ones, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead, these ones are all going to be, uh, they're all going to have four electrons. And then next one, we're going to have five, okay, and then six, these, these ones are your calcogens, and these ones, the next one, the group number seven, are your halogens, right here. And the last one are your noble gases, and they have eight. So if you can think about it, um, we start off with just one electron on the outside shell, and it, all the way to, it adds all the way up to eight electrons. Well, can we have more than eight? Well, the thing about um, electrons is that once it establishes to eight electrons in outside shell, it's actually very stable. It's not reactive at all because 80 electrons is what um, each atom would want to seek out. So you can see in the last group, your noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, all these ones all have eight electrons in outside shell. So if we were to draw this, you would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And because they have eight electrons, it's very stable and they're happy. They don't combine with anything. So you can see less reactive they are. Um, they're just they're content just with whatever they have. But if we look at number seven, this one will have seven electrons. Since all atoms we want to seek out to have that eight electrons in the outside shell, well, since these ones have seven, well, it needs one electron to fulfill that. So where are they going to get it from? Well, they can get it from, say, the first group because these guys want to get rid of one electron these guys on the seven want to get gain one electron so that makes that perfect sort of harmony so that's uh, which makes your halogens um, sort of reactive as well if they're combining with lithium sodium potassium etc and then your oxygen silicon selenium tellurium these ones are also on pol polonium these ones are also um, they have six electrons on the outside shell so that means they need to gain two so keep that in mind with your valence electrons because these ones will help you um, along the way when you're doing your binary compounds your ionic compounds um, another thing to know about your periodic table this kind of leads into the next step of naming compounds you have probably heard of, have heard of like um, h2o or salt is sodium chloride or calcium chloride or potassium nitrate all those things um, how do we name them so one really important thing to know when you start naming binary compounds is that you need to know how to separate your periodic table into your metals and non-metals so just as a brief outline here i'll do another video on this um, you can see that there is a staircase right here so anything that's left of the staircase, I just highlighted all the dark ones left on the staircase. These ones are your metals. So you can see these are metals. Why they're metals is that don't think about always the, the metals that we see in wires, but uh, more of the properties that they have. That means that they conduct really well with heat and also the electricity. And they can be um, bent into shape. Um, they can be drawn into wires, which is called uh, being ductile. And basically, um, conducting heat and electricity are really main ones. And 
that's your meadows. Um, when you look at the non-meadows, that's on the right side of the ladder. So you can see this, here's your ladder. On the right side, it's a small group, and these are non-metals. So don't always think that they have, they have to be gases. Think about the properties. That means that they can't conduct electricity, they can't conduct heat, and they're very brittle. So if you think about like carbon, I mean, carbon is not always like carbon gas. It's more if carbon's in the gas form, that's carbon dioxide, right? So if you have carbon like graphite or coal or something like that, it's very brittle. You can, when you're painting with charcoal or something like that, it's something that's brittle, not a very um, hard substance. So when you lead, or when you're doing your binary um, compounds or doing ionic bonds with covalent bonds, make sure you are understanding and identifying metals and non-metals. And anything that's sitting on this um, this staircase, that's your metal loids. That means that they share similar properties of metals and non-metals, and that's um, your metal loids. But if you have something that's on the left side and then bond it with something on the right side, you know, that's um, an ionic bond, which I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but uh, that's your periodic table. So make sure you understand that these families or groups are at the top. They are your columns. All of each of these ones share similar properties. So your first one is alkali. This is your second one is your alkaline earth. And then three and four. And the next one you need to know, number six, six that's your calcogens. So this one has six valence electrons in the outside shell. The next one, your halogens, you will have seven electrons in outside shell. And remember, um, atoms want to get eight electrons in total. So the last group is your noble gases because they have eight um, valence electrons. That means that they're very stable. So they don't like to react. You will never see really these guys reacting with anything, but you will likely see these guys reacting with the first group. And then to go across each of these ones, these are your periods. So that's your period one, two, three. Notice that they're going across four, five, six, and seven. All right, so that's your introductory video of the periodic table and um, watch the next one if, um, on naming compounds and covalent bonds.